analyzing gene expression. We're going to be looking at a few different techniques today. I don't want you to memorize every single thing about every technique. I want you to be able to understand the logic behind the techniques and to be able to um, recognize a few vocabulary words as well. So when we're talking about analyzing gene expression, we don't want to know what DNA is in an organism. We want to know what DNA is used within the organism. So let's say you have a fruit fly larvae, and we know that the same DNA is in the head, and that same DNA is in the cells in the next segment and the cells in the next segment and so on. So we've got a whole bunch of different segments of this fruit fly larvae and they all have um, a bunch of cells and the cells all have exactly the same DNA. But what DNA is used here compared to here, compared to here, compared to here? What DNA is used here on day two compared to day seven? So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So what we've got is the same DNA in every single cell and the DNA codes for RNA and this is the pre-RNA or primary transcript. And then that makes uh, messenger RNA. And remember, the messenger RNA has been processed, and so the introns have been taken out, and it's just the exons here. Probe is a piece of DNA or RNA that can stick to the gene or the messenger RNA that I'm interested in. So if this code reads um, A, C, C, U, then the probe would read U, G, G, A, and they would match each other. They're matching, meaning they go together. That's what hybridize means. Can they stick together? And a probe is the piece of DNA or RNA that actually sticks to the gene or the RNA of interest. The um, probe is going to have some kind of way to, to say, hey, I'm here, I'm here. So usually it's going to be fluorescent. Like in this case, you can see fluorescent yellow and... Um, and blue and green. when I was younger, uh, generally they used radioactive probes. Um, so the probes are used to identify where and when a gene is transcribed in an organism. So this method in situ hybridization, I don't need you to memorize that, but that looks at fluorescent dyes um, or uh, uh, probes that are used to look at um, RNA that's expressed in a particular intact organism. So that is, I think, the coolest, coolest thing ever. So here's a, a fruit fly larvae, and they used five different probes, and one of the probes was radiolabeled uh, red, and another was radiolabeled uh, blue, and another was radiolabeled, um, you know, green. And with, the, like, let's say the red one, they washed the whole thing with it, right? But the probe only stuck to messenger RNA that was actually expressed, and it was only expressed here. So that's a gene that's used for, I don't know if this is the neural tube or um, the gut or whatever, but it's only used in this part of the organism. So that is, I think, the coolest, coolest thing ever. A lot of times, though, instead of doing it in um, a live organism, we use these microarray assays, which can pinpoint exactly the cells um, that are expressing um, a particular gene. So let's say we have uh, a fruit fly. And maybe we were looking at fruit fly larvae that's uh, three days old. Um, three days old. Okay, so we're going to look at cells right here, and we're going to take them. And so here's the cell. And remember, a cell has a nucleus in it, and the nucleus has its DNA. And I actually don't want to look at DNA. I want to look at the genes that are expressed. So the DNA makes um, the primary transcript, and that's processed, and you make messenger RNA. And so the messenger RNA RNA that's spread out here floating in the cytoplasm. And that's actually what I'm interested in. So we're going to actually break open this cell and we're just going to isolate the cytoplasm. So we're just going to get the messenger RNA in here. And so I'm going to take the messenger RNA from the cells here and I'm going to uh, put it in each of the wells in this whole column. So a well looks like this. Each of these circles we're looking at from above, but if you looked at it from the side, has a hole in the top and then it has a bottom here. And what you can do is you can put a probe right here. And you can um, light up and you can connect it to the bottom like this. Okay. So you're going to take here and you're going to put them in this next column and the cells from here and you're going to put them in the next column and you're going to do that for all of the different segments. The cells here are going to go right here. So these are all going to be um, the, the messenger RNA you're going to find 
in the cells in different parts of the body um, along here. And then along here, we're going to use different probes. So here's probe one in this column, and I mean in this row, and probe two in this row, and probe three in this row. So the dark spots are spots with no hybridization. If you have hybridization, it's going to be uh, glowing. So I can say for probe one, uh, this cell was expressing it, and so was that one, and that one, and that one, but it wasn't expressed here, or here, or here, or here. So I can make, um, so microarray, that means you just have this whole huge grid, right? And the assay means you're putting in the probe and seeing if it hybridizes with the messenger RNA. And so this can show you what genes are expressed in different cells of the body. And then you can do the whole thing for day two, and the whole thing for day four, and the whole thing for day five. And, or you can do under different conditions. Maybe if the embryo is, it's, is uh, exposed to heat, what genes are expressed. Maybe it's a little bit different, right? So you can uh, do all kinds of stuff with this. And then you're going to use, for something this complex, you'd use a computer to um, help you put it back together to say, okay, these genes are expressed in which parts of the body in day one, and then the next day, what's it look like? In day two, what's it look like? And so on. Okay, so here's a breakdown of what happens. Here's a tissue sample, and so you're going to be looking at the tissue just in the, maybe the very, very, very front of the, um, of the embryo of the fruit fly. And we're going to break open these cells, and we're going to just use the cytoplasm here. We're going to get rid of the nucleus. And so here are the messenger RNA molecules that are actually expressed. So you remember that DNA codes for RNA, and that RNA is a primary transcript, or I'm going to call it a pre-RNA because it's shorter to write, and then that RNA goes for messenger RNA. And so this messenger RNA has the introns taken out, just the exons. So what I'm going to do now is use that enzyme reverse transcriptase to make the complementary DNA. And so I can do this for all the different tissue uh, types in the entire different fruit fly. Um, and the other thing that I'm going to do when I make this complementary DNA is um, I'm going to radio label them. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to label them with fluoresce. So now I've got a whole bunch of cDNA molecules, and um, these are also strands because they just uh, messenger RNA. And so this is not all the DNA that was found in the cell. This is the DNA that was made from the RNA that was in the cell. So it's only the transcribed genes. So in here, I'm not looking um, at any of the genes that weren't transcribed just the used DNA, right? It's not the DNA that's been turned off or the DNA that's not used in that part of the body. So already so, so, so cool, right? So here's my microarray. So this is a plastic dish and each of these, we're looking kind of at the top, but if you look at it from the side, each of these is a well, it, it goes down. And in here on the bottom, I'm going to put a probe. So here's uh, a probe for gene one that, that I'm interested in. So that's going to be my first probe, so probe one. In here, I'm going to put probe two. In here, I'm going to put probe three. In here, probe four. In here, I'm going to put probe five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm going to take this uh, radio labeled DNA, and I'm going to put it in after that. Um, and then I'm going to wash it off. So the only the cDNA, like let's say this one matches probe four. It hybridizes with probe four. That's going to be stuck in here. But in here, I don't have any DNA that matches probe one or two or three. So when I rinse, these are going to just go away and there's going to be nothing for it. Um, there's no complementary DNA that matches probe five. I'm interested in uh, this gene five, but there's nothing matching. So I guess that means not rest. Six, seven, eight. Here's probe eight and it's lighting up, which means that when I put in my complementary DNA, um, there must have been a gene here that was expressed and that hybridizes or matches my probe 8. And so that means probe 8, it, this one shows that that gene was actually expressed. So I'm sure that gene 1 is present in here, or I'd imagine that it is, um, but it's in the DNA and it was never um, transcribed, so it's not in the cytoplasm. And so you can do that for every single type of tissue. Um, there's a, a whole lot of different uh, genes that you can look at at different periods of time, um, whether it's looking at um, human cells or whether it's looking at the fruit fly cells. Um, so that's uh, the general technique 
for looking at which genes are expressed. There are other ways to look at what genes are expressed and what happens when a gene's not working. So one thing to do is to look at mutants. So there are um, people with various mutations. Everybody's got mutations, right? But if we're looking at um, a particular disease, we might want to look at what's different between um, people with the disease um, in terms of their DNA and people without the disease. If we're looking at uh, non-humans, if we're looking at like, let's say mice or something, you can actually do more than that. You can actually knock out a gene. So that's what's going on in here. So let's say you have this uh, mommy mouse and from her um, ovaries, you're going to take up embryonic cells. And so these are going to be um, just in individual cells that you're going to isolate. And these are ES, that means stem cells. And so these are going to be cells that can become anything. Else. And so you take um, the DNA out and you use genetic um, editing, maybe CRISPR, to uh, get rid of a certain gene. And so then you put that back into the embryo and then you implant the embryo into the mom and the embryo grows. And so then you look at the babies. And so she gives birth to her babies and here they are. And some of them maybe came from embryos that didn't get the gene knocked out, but some of them um, have a double mutation. So a mutation in both of the genes. And so what you can do is look at this mouse and say, hey, what different this is compared to the normal wild type mouse? And if there's something that's different, like maybe this mouse doesn't have toenails. Okay, now I know that that gene must be important for making toenails. Another thing that you can do is use RNA interference. So you're not changing the DNA anymore. What you're doing is um, injecting some RNA, um, could be like micro RNA, for example, and that will um, match up with the RNA that you're interested in and make you not able to translate it. So you've still got all the same DNA, but you're affecting it at the RNA to protein level and you're not allowing it to be translated. So if you inject some double-stranded RNA and you want to say, hey, I don't know what this stuff is for, but I'd love to know. So I'm going to put that into a tissue sample. And I know this tissue is maybe from a pancreas and it's supposed to be making insulin. Okay, so now I'm not allowing the insulin to be translated. I look at those cells and I say, oh, there's no insulin. I guess this gene must be important for insulin because um, I'm blocking that gene. With humans, um, we, we don't do those kind of experiments, but we can look at the population. Let's say I'm really interested in Huntington's disease and I want to know what gene causes Huntington's disease. Back in the 80s, we didn't know that. So what they did is they took a gazillion people um, and they looked at people with Huntington's, Huntington's disease and they looked for um, um, SNPs. So these are single nucleotide polymorphisms. I think I define it here, yeah. So an SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. We all have mutations in our DNA. We all have variations from each other. On average, average every 100 to 300 base pairs have something different between me and you, right? So these are genetic markers. And if you look at someone with Huntington's disease, they're going to have a whole bunch of these SNPs, a whole bunch of polymorphisms that are different from mine. But if you look at 1,000 people with um, Huntington's disease and you look at what they have in common and what they have in common compared to the general population, you might find a gene, you might find a polymorphism that's the same in everybody with Huntington's disease. And that might be different from the general population. So if you look at people with Huntington's disease, some of them have blue eyes, some of them have brown eyes. So you're not looking at stuff like that. You need to find a single nucleotide polymorphism that's the same in, in all of them, but different from the general population. And that's generally, it's like kind of like finding a needle in a haystack um, with more powerful computers. It's certainly a little bit easier now than it used to be. But that's the process that scientists go through in order to figure out which genes might cause um, a particular disease. So the DNA is typically amplified by PCR and then um, single nu nucleotide polymorphisms that are shared um, with people who have the disorder but not among the general population can help pinpoint the um, exact gene. And I think that's it for today.